So, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I ask you uh, to take your seats. And before giving the floor to the moderator of our first um, panel, uh, uh, which will uh, review current cooperation mechanisms in combating trafficking in uh, human beings. I would like just to inform you that those who wish to participate in the discussion uh, will have uh, to uh, register with my uh, colleague Alexander Kirilenko sitting behind me. And I also um, I would like to encourage you to uh, ask a, a question to our panel panelists uh, from the uh, floor. So the uh, um, person whom we requested to moderate our uh, session is, I am proud to say, the participant of all our 17 and now 18th Alliance uh, Against Trafficking in uh, Persons. So uh, you know him well in this audience. Very often uh, he uh, also uh, contributed to uh, the discussions and recommendations coming from our alliance uh, conferences. He is the uh, national uh, rapporteur on trafficking in human beings in Greece, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Greece. And I would like, before giving the floor to him, I would like also to thank him and Greece authorities, Greece delegation here for the good uh, cooperation. Uh, currently, mm, we are working on the implementation of our needs assessment report, uh, which was uh, uh, done on uh, the findings of our uh, visits to uh, hotspots and uh, uh, camps in uh, Greece. Italy, Turkey, uh, Serbia, and some other states. So, without much ado, I am giving the floor to Heracles Moskov. Uh, Excellencies, uh, dear friends and colleagues, welcome uh, to this session. Uh, before I introduce the four uh, distinguished uh, speakers of our, of our first panel, let me wholeheartedly thank the OSCE, and especially Ambassador uh, Yarbusinova for this honorable invitation to moderate the first panel. And as you said, reviewing on my own uh, personal institutional memory of OSCE's action against trafficking that goes back at least 18 years ago, uh, allow me to say that this experience has been um, a very formative uh, period for me. And what followed uh, in my service as a national coordinator and now rapporteur uh, was inspired by the spirit uh, of cooperation and partnership uh, I witnessed here at Hofburg. So the OSCE is still a forerunner in identifying new challenges and opportunities, as well as in suggesting innovative solutions. And this 18th Alliance uh, Conference is an example of this forward-looking outlook of the OSCE, an example of uh, taking stock of our successes, but also of our failures in the allocation and execution of our responsibilities, and, and an example of uh, what concerted action can be taken collectively to redeem the shortcomings. So the focus of this year's uh, high-level conference is to promote the importance of inclusive partnerships to further enhance the coherence of anti-trafficking efforts and strengthen cooperation at the local, national, regional, and international level. Indeed, nobody can deny that everyone has a role. We all agree on that, but nobody, dear friends, can really furnish an ideal type where this unity in diversity worked so well that we prevailed and won the battle against those vicious criminals who trade humans as commodities. So this togetherness, this cross-dimensional partnership is still not fully realized, even though it is politically or legally binding in so many international legal instruments and leading uh, organizations, uh, political organizations such as the OSCE. So let me pose a, a few questions as uh, food for thought for uh, all of our speakers and all of us. Why, despite the so many years we reiterate the imperative role of a cross-dimensional emphasis on prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnership, our frontline professionals still have to navigate within a compartmentalized and fragmented bureaucratic roadmap? Why, 
Instead of investing in inclusive partnerships, the esprit de corps of uh, several states or even civil society um, stakeholders are more comfortable in inward-looking solutions and treat public-private partnerships with suspicion and mistrust. Why one-sided solutions, usually law enforcement solutions, failing to identify and assist potential victims, the key term is, of course, potential victims, who are suffering in silence, and why our ambivalence to adopt cross-regional partnerships means that organized crime thrives at the absence of a comprehensive and coordinated response. Why the statistical data of all our countries uh, are definitely not commensurate to the real magnitude of the problem. Why are considerable human and financial resources and our sophisticated laws and action plans are not coming across to more potential victims and are not bringing more perpetrators to justice? As far as I'm concerned, these are all questions of national ownership, of the extent to which today's topic of inclusive partnership is understood and implemented, not just by officials or frontline professionals, but by society as a whole. Unfortunately, our societies tolerate and still treat exploitation as something anecdotal or even as something not normal and natural, that, they, that the victims have signed up for it. So we need to change mentalities and practices. We need to widen the scope of our mandates and stop treating our jobs as a ticking the box exercise. I'm afraid that the solution is not exclusively up to law enforcement. Instead, we must see the large picture. We must identify what kind of unusual sometimes partnerships and synergies can protect vulnerable people at risk of being trafficked. So the added value of this conference is that we will examine existing, more traditional anti-trafficking partnerships, along with the benefits of innovative cooperation modalities, which often remain invisible, informalized, multidisciplinary frameworks. A second emphasis will also be placed on new actors whose engagement would bring added value to anti-trafficking response. In my country, Greece, for example, we are trying to foster an inclusive public-private partnership with stakeholders as diverse as the hospitals, the private sector, uh, the schools, the cultural sector, the church, the local administration, uh, trade unions, and others. But without further ado, let me introduce our four, four, our four distinguished panelists who will review current cooperation and coordination mechanisms and underline the need for complementarity of efforts to better address trafficking in human beings. They will also discuss the comparative advantage of each tra anti-trafficking actor, along with means of improving sharing of expertise and overcoming challenges when working together. Speakers will highlight the importance to prevent and detect the crime, as well as protect its victims by providing example, examples of state-led national coordination mechanisms at the operational level, reinforced by the contribution of civil society, including NGOs, trade unions, and religious organizations. Our rapporteur uh, will collect and elaborate the recommendations of the speakers and the interventions from the discussion and then present them during panel three. So our first speaker is Mr. Frederick Kurtz. He is a Deputy General Prosecutor, Ministry of Justice, Belgium. He holds a law degree and a specialist degree in, in international and European law. After having exercised as a lawyer specialized in uh, social issues for the Liège Bar, he served as a judge in the Labour Court before being appointed Deputy General Prosecutor at the Labour Court of Liège. Since uh, 2004, he has been the head coordinator of the network of experts in human trafficking set up by the Board of the General Prosecutors. In this capacity, he participated in the development of the criminal policy on prosecution of human trafficking and coordinates its implementation by prosecutors and labour law prosecutors and labor law prosecutors. Mr. Kurtz is a member of GRETA, the group of experts of the Council of Europe on THB, since 2013. He will discuss the Belgian cooperation mechanism at the operational level and also the cooperation between prosecutors and their partners in combating human trafficking. So it's the Belgian network of experts. Excellency, the floor is yours for approximately 13 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I will switch to French, just war a warning. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, when we discuss in Belgium mechanisms for coordination on trafficking in human beings, 
we talk about the interdepartmental coordination unit against trafficking in human beings. This unit brings together all of the uh, various actors involved in the field in combating count trafficking in human beings, and I refer to members of different departments of the government, as well as representatives uh, of the prosecutors general and its board, which I will refer to in a moment, as well as representatives of uh, civil society. These are NGOs, as well as re reception centers for victims of trafficking in human beings, and the national rapporteur, as well as any partners involved in countering trafficking in human beings. So this is an opportunity to coordinate our actions and set up a national plan of action as well as to determine means and projects for actions in order to counter trafficking in human beings within a specific period. But this is not what I'm going to talk to you about today. Today, I would like to talk to you about uh, the second type of coordination in Belgium, which is networks of expertise of specialized general prosecutors in countering trafficking in human beings. Now, let me provide you with some information to provide you with the context, and that is that uh, in Belgium, there are five prosecutors general brought together in what we call a board of general prosecutors. Uh, and these, this board is in charge of determining criminal policy in the uh, various uh, areas of criminal activity that we face. Now, these are in turn divided among each uh, general prosecutor. There is the general prosecutor in Liège, uh, in charge of countering trafficking in human beings. And this is why I am here before you today, because I am one of uh, the people in working in this area in Liège. Now, establishing criminal policy in various uh, areas, including trafficking in human beings, uh, the board of uh, general prosecutors is able to set up what are called networks of expertise, which are composed of the uh, various prosecutors of the public ministries who are able to, in various jurisdictions, cover this topic. These are also people who come in from the outside to fight against uh, trafficking in human beings. The mission of these networks of expertise is to ensure the promotion and dissemination of information among the various members of the prosecutors and, of course, can also be tasked with support missions. Now, as I've said, these networks of expertise are constituted of specialized uh, prosecutors uh, these are a reference magistrates. And so the Board of General Prosecutors has decided to create networks of expertise in order to fight against trafficking in human being. And in each judicial body or district, a magistrate has been especially appointed to cover the topic these are the reference magistrates. Uh, now, in their judicial district, they are the most important person in dealing with uh, prosecuting crimes of trafficking in human beings. And this person will uh, launch investigations uh, and take other actions uh, before the courts, and this is the person who will be in contact with partners in the framework of the national mechanism, which in Belgium is organized 
in such a way so that there is direct to contact the very minute that a case of trafficking in human being has been identified between the reception center for victims, the alien's office, uh, if the potential victim is uh, a foreigner, as well as among the police, the social inspectors, and other authorities. So the reference magistrate will be in constant contact with these various partners. This person is thus the key link between these various authorities as well as among the magistrates or prosecutors in a certain area interested in the case that this person is following. For instance, I refer to prosecutors for cases involving minors where minors may or we may fear that minors are victims of trafficking in human beings. So there is a connection that must exist between the reference magistrate in trafficking in human being and the magistrate or prosecutor in the jurisdiction involving minors. And there's also a link to the a federal prosecutor. Now, in Belgium, the federal prosecutor deals with uh, all of the uh, largest uh, cases covering the entirety of our territory, which are international in nature and of uh, a specific uh, gravity, for instance, terrorism. So when the reference magistrate in a given jurisdiction decides to call upon Eurojust or Eurojust in order to set up an investigative team when there are international repercussions in a case, then this magistrate will contact the federal prosecutor. There's also contact between the reference magistrate and the administrative authorities in the jurisdiction who are involved in the case. And I would refer here, for example, to the municipality or town in which we find uh, forced uh, begging. There's also a, a reference magistrate in the field, thus in each jurisdiction or district, but there's also a reference magistrate at a higher level in the appeals court uh, architecture and uh, in the sub-directorate of the labor inspector. We have a specialized uh, magistrates in uh, labor and social security who have both civil and criminal authority. So in the second level, the reference magistrates are also de designated for trafficking in human beings, and they ensure the implementation of the criminal policy decided by the Board of Pro General Prosecutors in the field. So these reference magistrates at this second level who are higher in the pyramid, as it were, are also reference magistrates for those dealing with cases in the field. Now, these reference magistrates are 55 in total, and they carry out... Uh, prosecution and implement criminal policy, they also undergo specialized trainings with respect to countering trafficking in human beings. These magistrates are key elements in fighting trafficking in human beings as a result. They are a part of what I have already referred to, which is the 
network of expertise on trafficking in human beings. Now this is something which is uh, not tangible. It is what it is we find with what we find behind uh, the a stage as it were. It is in fact uh, the network bringing together all of these magistrates and prosecutors which will submit to a coordination team of magistrates that I'll refer to in a moment. They will submit any important issues that they face and any problems they identify or new trends in their jurisdictions. And within this network of expertise, they will also benefit from a sharing of jurisprudence in this matter and will transmit it as identified. So the network of expertise is uh, one within which there are working groups set up on specific topics. Let me give you an example. When the Board of General Prosecutors considered that it was important to provide for a specific criminal policy concerning the issue of forced begging, and here I am referring to trafficking in human beings in order to uh, cause these people to carry out forced begging, then the network set up a working group. These could be prosecutors or representatives of the police or specialized groups uh, fighting forced begging in the field, and these groups try to determine whether or not uh, There are, and we note that in uh, Brussels there are uh, constant sightings of uh, persons who are begging, whether or not there is a network of identifiable individuals behind this practice so that we could propose a criminal policy. Because one of the important missions of the networks of expertise is to suggest or propose to the Board of Prosecutors General criminal policies to then be applied by the reference magistrates. Now, specifically, the network of expertise functions thanks to a coordination team which is made up of 17 members these are reference magistrates in trafficking in human beings at the second level in that pyramid that I referred to earlier, that is for the Court of Appeals, as well as representatives of the King's Prosecutor's Offices, a representative of the Labor Law Prosecutor's Office, as well as representatives of the Service of Criminal Policy and the Statistical analyst service because there are important questions that need to be examined regarding statistics and a representative of the legislation department. Since there is uh, the need to coordinate regarding implementing criminal policy and this must involve coordination with existing legislation. The coordination team is led by a head coordinator who represents the general prosecutor the coordination team 
meets uh, several times a year and organizes uh, plenary meetings of the network of expertise. It uh, prepares training programs. And if I may add uh, something with respect to the network of expertise, I think it's important to note that the coordination team is really the interface between the prosecutors in the field who will bring up questions that are relevant to them and the general prosecutors. In the coordination team, there are opportunities to discuss what's happening in the field so that it is possible to adapt uh, criminal policy in order to make the fight against trafficking in human beings more effective. Now, coming back to the plenary meetings of the Network of Expertise, these are held a minimum of every two years, and they're very important because they are plenary meetings during which in the course of one day, all of the magistrates, uh, the reference magistrates in the network will meet to reflect on topical themes. A uh, morning is spent uh, listening to reports uh, on current issues, and then there is an evaluation of reports on trafficking in human beings, and in the afternoon, generally, there are workshops during which we will not only bring together magistrates and prosecutors, but also their partners. So I refer to reception centers for victims, national rapporteurs, that is a partner of the prosecutor in that they are an important element in fighting trafficking in human beings, and notably in Belgium, as well as police, social inspectors, and all of those around the table will then examine a specific case. And the role of the head coordinator and the coordination team is to find interesting cases that bring up a number of important issues, and then we ask for this group to brainstorm together the manner in which the case could be resolved. We don't want to try to find one single answer. What we are looking for here is a true exchange between these various partners on the cases which are submitted to them. These are very important events I will conclude in just a moment let me say to you that at the local level the reference magistrate is tasked with organizing it will be done in one minute uh, son chargé with organizing coordination meetings among the various actors in the field. These are operational meetings, which bring together once again the police in the field, magistrates, prosecutors, those specialized in cases dealing with minors. And during these meetings, there is a discussion of new trends emerging in the jurisdiction on the issue of trafficking in human beings. I think that I would like now to conclude by saying that if we add together the setting up of networks of expertise and an institution of uh, general prosecutors specialized in each jurisdiction, what we manage to do is have horizontal and vertical communication happening at the same time among them, which allows for an improvement in the contacts and the trust among 
all of the partners involved so that we can be as effective as possible in countering this scourge of trafficking human beings. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Kurt. Uh, well, certainly the issue of trust and uh, confidence, uh, especially between law enforcement and the other service providers, uh, is very crucial. And I'm sure most of the colleagues around the table can uh, uh, can agree how, how difficult it is for uh, in most of our countries to really work with the, with the prosecutors and the judges because uh, obviously they are they are autonomous they are uh, very uh, it's very hard for the, for us to to take them abroad and uh, uh, and also make them participate in in uh, in, uh, in uh, projects that are uh, having common deliverables uh, with other stakeholders so i think that your model the belzal model and what you described is very important for us and i'm sure we should study it very carefully because you really uh, you really pr create a bridge between the networks of experts and the other frontline professionals who are coming across potential victims who are suffering in silence <coughs> and need uh, identification and referral and all the other um, protection um, package that goes with it so with no further ado um, we should uh, move to our uh, second uh, speaker uh, who is uh, ambassador Erdan Chilun uh, he's a human security policy studies center uh, from Mon Mongolia the ambassador worked in the foreign ministry of Mongolia for 32 years uh, he's now retired uh, he served in uh, various capacities, including Foreign Minister of <coughs> Mongolia and Ambassador to the UN in New York. He also served as a Foreign Policy Advisor to two Presidents and uh, the Prime Minister of Mongolia. He has extensive experience in uh, multilateral diplomacy, participated in 28 sessions of the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Uh, his elective posts include uh, ch Chairman of the First uh, Committee, Disarmament and International Security, of the 50th session of uh, the UN General Assembly, Chairman of the UN uh, Disarmament um, Commission, Chairman of the Group of uh, Landlocked uh, Developing Countries, Member of uh, the Executive Board of uh, UNESCO, President of the 5th International Conference of uh, New and uh, Restored Democracies. At present, Ambassador is a uh, Founder and Director of uh, Mongolian NGO, the Human Security Policy Studies Center and uh, he will discuss uh, the overall situation of human trafficking in Mongolia, uh, as well as the cooperation between the NGO and the government, and the partnership uh, among NGOs. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Excellency. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, Mr. Moderator, let me begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to you, Madam Ambassador, for inviting me to this important conference. I hope that the recommendations that will materialize at the end of this conference will help mobilize efforts at the international level towards ending this heinous crime. I am a representative of a very small NGO which was involved in human trafficking problems in the last 10 years or so. Therefore, the extent of our involvement has been understandably limited and confined to achieving certain specific results outlined by the projects that were implemented by us. In 2008, when we first raised the issue of human trafficking with some high-level officials in the government, they raised their brows in surprise, asking me whether such a problem exists in our country. And that was the usual reaction that not only of the government officials, but also of many people in the streets. That was the time when our NGO, the Human Security Policy Studies Center uh, started its work on human trafficking with the assistance and support of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And that was so far the only comprehensive project which lasted four years. There were other smaller projects funded by the European Union, Asia Foundation, US Asia Foundation. At that time, few NGOs were involved in combating human trafficking. For us, this was also a new domain. Ten years later today, however, the change is palpable. Today we have a standalone law, which was adopted in 2012. Eight relevant existing legislation were amended so that they would conform with the new standalone law. Two shelters were established for victims of trafficking. Wide-ranging prevention and awareness raising activities were conducted in a continuous manner. 
We helped the Ministry of Education include a brief anti-trafficking, human trafficking tool in social science programs in high schools and universities. Law enforcement officers from various parts of the country participated in a, in a good number of trainings. Many NGOs and relevant governmental institutions participated in the activities that brought about significant change. As a result, over 90% of respondents in the survey conducted a few years ago, following the conclusion of the project, gave an affirmative answer to the question whether they were aware and understood the problem of human trafficking. The previous result was 40%. So 90%, that was a big uphill, uh, although uphill, but a big achievement of, our, uh, of many NGOs that were involved in this, uh, in this work. It goes without saying that the high percentage had been reached mainly to the continuous and persevering work done by the NGOs. Even today, unfortunately, the bulk of the work is being accomplished by the CSOs. Although the government and its relevant agencies are aware of the seriousness of the human trafficking problem in the country, due to several reasons, this does not seem to be a priority issue for the government at this time. The main reasons are, of course, lack of human and financial resources and public servants not working steady on the same job. Nonetheless, it should be noted that, the, that Mongolia became party to the Palermo Protocol in 2008, and it adopted its second national program to combat human trafficking last year. The success or failure of that program is another matter, and it is not a subject of our, of our deliberations today. In general, we see the human trafficking situation in Mongolia as still serious, the risk of being trafficked as high. The latest Trafficking in Persons report published by the United States State Department classifies Mongolia as tier two country, meaning that, quote, the government of Mongolia does not fully meet the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking. However, it is making sig significant efforts to do so, unquote. Mongolia is considered a source and destination country for men, women, and children subjected to forced labor and sex trafficking. As far as the dynamics of the prosecution of perpetrators is concerned, there is little change in the number of prosecution cases. It is around one to three per year, with five to 15 defendants sentenced to different years of, in of imprisonment. Well, this is by way of an introduction. I have been asked by the host organization to talk about the cooperation mechanisms in combating trafficking in human beings, including NGO partnership in dealing with the problem. Our experience in cooperating with national authorities and other relevant actors. So I will dwell on it from the perspective of my own country, Mongolia. I will talk briefly about the cooperation uh, issues at national and regional and international levels. First, on the at the national level and cooperation with national authorities. At the very beginning of the implementation of our project, it was highly important for us to raise the awareness of our government institutions. The human trafficking problem as such exists in our society and that there is a need to take specific steps to squarely deal with the problem at an early stage. Government uh, representatives around this table are probably aware that what usually happens with government institutions is that they deal with the problem when it is already in an advanced stage. At least this is the case with our country. What we needed first was to put on paper the existing human trafficking situation in Mongolia and the steps that were needed to start resolving the problem. We found a legal expert in the Mongolian National Human Rights Commission who agreed to write up such a paper. Fortunately, the person who wrote the paper was one of the commissioners of the Human, Trafficking, uh, Human Rights Commission. After the paper was finalized, we agreed that it would become that particular year's report of the Human Rights Commission to the Parliament. 
Since that time, we worked with, ministry, with the Ministry of Justice, National Police Department, Central Intelligence Agency, CSOs in drafting the law. At the final stages, foreign legal experts also participated in this exercise. It took us uh, three and a half years to finalize it and have adopted uh, by the parliament. We also worked with the police department to help them create a special unit that would deal with human trafficking problem. Today, this unit is called Combating Human Organized Crime and Human Trafficking Unit. We also have such units in all districts of the capital city and in three provinces that border with China and Russia. The urgency of human trafficking problem prompted the Ministry of Justice to create a sub-council specifically dealing with human trafficking issues. This body meets uh, several times a year has an annual plan of activities and also includes representatives of a few NGOs. Our center is a, also a member of this sub-council. Uh, the National Human Rights Commission has within its structure an advisory board consisting of NGOs at various directions, of various directions. And our center was on the board two two-year terms. Our work on drafting the law combating human trafficking gave us an opportunity to work with some members of parliament and they became active supporters of our cause, which, is at, leg which at a later stage led to the creation of a lo lobby group within the parliament. The lobby group today includes members of parliament and also some officials from the government. Amongst them, we even had a deputy minister for foreign affairs who later became uh, an MP, a member of parliament, during the parliamentary elections last year. Members of the lobby group participate in various activities organized by the network of NGOs combating human trafficking. Now about a few words about partnership with NGOs, our partners. Today, some 20 or over NGOs are working in the area of human trafficking. Our center, with the support of the European Union, set up in 2014 a network of NGOs deal dealing with human trafficking problems. The network consists of 19 organizations and amongst them one international organization, Caritas Czech Republic. It has its own rules and regulations as well as digital quarterly news release. The network allows to deal with victims of trafficking and other issues in a much more concerted and coordinated way. The network also carries much more weight whenever a joint action is needed vis-a-vis -vis the government and its organizations. There exist uh, numerous difficulties in turning the network into an efficient instrument. The main problem, as is well known, lies in the lack of financial resources. Most of the members in the network are in, in such a situation. Lack of quali qualified personnel also makes it difficult for such organizations to get hold of projects from donor countries and organizations. Our own uh, center has been facing the same difficulties in recent years. Some of our people did pro are doing pro bono work and are doing it for several years, but it is very difficult to expect them to work indefinitely. The NGO culture in Mongolia over the last two decades has taken deep roots in our society and their influence is growing steadily. But as, as I said earlier, due to financial and other issues and lack of government and other assistance and support, their effectiveness remains problematic. In point of fact, many of these NGOs are short-lived and their effectiveness in many ways leaves much to be desired. Private business donates funds mostly to those activities which are popular and publicize their name. And this is not the case as far as human trafficking problem is concerned. Regional and international cooperation. Several members uh, of our network became members of, uh, of uh, Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women. Mongolian member organizations particip participate in its meetings and provide the alliance with relevant information about the work they are doing in this area. Our center is also a member of the Asia-Pacific Refugee Rights Network, and we take part in its meetings and contribute our experience to its work. 
Membership in such organizations gives us an opportunity to be abreast of the current situation with human trafficking around the world, to learn from that experience, which helps us greatly in tackling numerous issues with which we are faced. Upon our initiative and support, the Mongolian government concluded an agreement with Macau, specifically dealing with combating human trafficking. We helped our police department at border city with China to sign an MOU on cooperation with its Chinese counterpart. Understood. Thank you. Notwithstanding some positive, uh, positive movement in this area, much is to be done by our foreign ministry with the countries where human trafficking is taking place. In the last few years, very little came about in moving forward in this area. By way of conclusion, let me say that a decade uh, has elapsed since the beginning of our concerted actions against human trafficking in Mongolia. All in all, those were the years of cooperation among various key actors, both governmental and non-governmental. And as I said earlier, the initiative and hard work fall mainly on the shoulders of the civil society organizations. Difficulties in collaboration between government and NGOs mainly stem, stem from the fact that the government does not see human trafficking as a priority issue. Consequently, there is little that we can expect from the government in terms of funding and support. This situation will likely continue to persist in the years to come, particularly because of the difficult economic situation in the country. Therefore, notwithstanding some tangible results on the ground, which made significant impact on civic and government awareness in the problem, the efforts made by the NGO community are not designed as an integral part of a national effort by the government, uh, by, the, uh, by the government or other partners. Hence, the sustainability of the impact is questionable. What is needed to effectively fight the problem is the strategic support from the donors to be provided at the national level to align national action plans and national budget with anti-trafficking efforts. In addition, the difficulties are exacerbated by the constant changes of public servants whenever a new government is installed. The only way at this time is for the CSOs to continue to work in order to keep the human trafficking issue in the radar of the government. We have to bear in mind also the fact that domestic violence has the pride of place in the social agenda of the government. There is little for me to say by way of conclusion about partnership amongst NGOs other than what I have already said. I wish to add here one point. In order to make the work of NGOs more efficient, it is important to set up a referral system which will make it easier for victims to get needed services. Such a referral system could be expanded to include relevant governmental institutions which will make the coordination and cooperation between NGOs and the government much more efficient. As to our collaboration with foreign and international organizations, those constitute our main donors. However, the role, their role in Mongolia is also diminishing year by year. Some important donors disappeared from the scene altogether. Others are involved in very small projects which by any account cannot make a tangible difference. Our country, I wish to say here by name, uh, one country I wish to say by name is Sweden. They are funding Talita Asia NGO in Mongolia, which works, which works with victims of human trafficking. The most important characteristic of this assistance is that they provide funds on a long-term basis. And this is exactly what victims of human trafficking need. What is most important for the aid to be effective, no doubt is first, long-term basis on which projects should rely on. Second, funding is to be continuous and more, and more significant. And third, efficiency and impact of projects does not depend on numbers, but more on quality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, well, I believe that your long and decorated career uh, as an official is also an embodiment uh, of what we are trying to do as an inclusive partnership because you now you ended up as somebody who's an activist an NGO leader and you're trying to uh, you know as I understand lobby and advocate in your country for uh, for more political will for more funding for more sustainability for the NGOs allow me to say that is it is also a matter of political pressure that comes from from uh, the bottom upwards so the extent to which you can draw more people and more uh, public opinion with you uh, will uh, somehow 
um, determine the, the effectiveness of, uh, of, uh, of the, and sustainability of the NGOs in the Mongolia. So um, we are running late, I'm afraid. So we move uh, to on our third uh, speaker, which is um, uh, Mr. Irun uh, Bernard. Uh, he's um, a director in Human and uh, Trade uh, Union Rights at the International Trade Union Confederation. The, that is the global umbrella organization for national trade unions. In this capacity, he coordinates human um, rights uh, action by and, and, and uh, by and between trade unions, NGOs, and other stakeholders in countries where these rights are most at risk. He advises uh, on uh, policy and strategies to more effectively empower and protect the most vulnerable workers, including domestic workers, informal workers, children, migrant workers, and indigenous peoples against the worst forms of exploitation. Since 2007, he has been coordinating a specific campaign to increase awareness of trade unionists worldwide regarding the issue of traditional and contemporary forms of forced labor, including human trafficking and to build the capacity of trade unions to fight them by offering technical assistance to a global network of national trade union uh, focal points on forced labor and human trafficking. Uh, the development of also of trade union policy and program and, and uh, field-based projects. Um, Mr. Bernard will discuss the, road, the role of trade unions in combating trafficking, the experience of, uh, in uh, different alliances, and uh, highlight a specific uh, new peer review platform offering um, uh, migrant workers uh, trustworthy information on the ethical behaviors of uh, recruitment agencies. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Um, distinguished delegates, um, first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting us to address um, this alliance. Um, the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, has been part of the alliance for several years. Um, but realizing that we're still uh, a, a bit less of a traditional partner in this house, I think it's worthwhile recalling um, what the ITUC is. Uh, the ITUC is the global umbrella for national trade union centers. So we group uh, national trade union centers in 163 countries um, and coordinate policy and action in that regard. Um, we have regional structures um, and the one relevant for this uh, conversation is the Pan-European Regional Council um, that, that includes uh, trade unions from uh, Russia to Ireland, um, including also the European uh, Trade Union Confederation, which is the the social dialogue counterpart for the European um, Commission. We're um, a global organization, uh, unitary and pluralist. We group democratic and government independent trade unions. And we work very closely with uh, what we call global union federations, who are coordinating bodies at the international level of trade unions that organize around uh, in different sectors. So the International Transport Workers uh, Federation or the Building and Woodworkers International are close um, partners to our organization. Coming to the role of trade unions in combating trafficking, um, the clear mission and mandate of trade unions is to defend workers' rights and interests. It is the role of trade unions to basically um, interfere with a process of exploitation. If we, if, as, as it's been highlighted uh, on many occasions, if, if trafficking or uh, for forced labor is a process over time and over degree in exploitation, what, wor what trade unions do is defend workers' rights that would interrupt such a process that, uh, of accumulation of violations of, of workers' rights. So we are doing work on the prevention side. Uh, speakers mentioned it earlier uh, as well. We have a role in preventing workers to end up as victims of either trafficking or forced labor in the first place. To be able to fulfill that role, trade unions obviously need the freedom to operate. Workers need the freedom to organize, to build collective um, power, 
if a certain re regulatory uh, environment um, prevents uh, trade unionists from speaking out against the exploitation, if um, an environment retaliates against workers that speak out against the exploitation, the system doesn't work and trade unions can't fulfill their role. Now, I would want to come to a very um, specific um, example of what trade unions could do in combating trafficking. Um, I want to refer to a case in the Netherlands two, two years ago where um, in the transport industry, the transport sector, where uh, a Dutch company established a sham subsidiary in Bratislava, in Slovakia, which what we call a post box uh, company, from which it had trucks driving all over Europe with low wage truck drivers recruited from Eastern Europe, um, including even uh, drivers from the Philippines. These drivers were living in terrible conditions, paid poverty wages with very long working hours, and they were not allowed to leave their trucks or go home for months at a time. The Dutch Transport Workers Union reached out to these uh, workers uh, on, on big uh, trucker parking places where they would find them cooking their meals outside uh, and between trucks in the snow and the rain. And these drivers would be terrified to speak out and to complain as they did not have a solid migration status and would be expelled immediately if found by the police. What followed after was a careful process coordinated between the transport unions uh, in Slovakia, in Germany and the Netherlands, and the labor inspectorate in the Netherlands to find the right time and place when they could be heard by the labor inspectors on the Dutch territory, given the ne necessary protection and the opportunity to cooperate in criminal proceedings against the abusive companies. This was a specific case coordinated by the International Transport Workers Union, but I think it highlights what the added value of global networks of trade unions is in uh, tackling um, the issue of trafficking which is in many occasions a um, transnational affair. Now, I, would, I, I think I could name a, a, a larger number of countries in sitting around this, this uh, table in where you see an increasing cooperation, an increasing role of labor inspectors, trade unions, social partners in addressing trafficking. Um, but I would want to highlight um, major issues at the global level as well, taking this opportunity. Um, and I want to come back to the latest report of, the, of Greta, the group of experts of which uh, one is sitting on our panel, um, that concluded that across the European, the broader European region, there is an increasing trend of increasing trafficking for labor exploitation. Um, Monique Villa mentioned this morning the numbers at the global level from the UN, the International Labor Organization, 40 million um, in the latest count. But I do want to mention that ever since they started counting, the numbers have gone up. I remember 12.3 million. I remember 15 million. Now I remember 21 million. Now we're at 40 million. Um, and to us, representing workers in the global economy, this is a cannery in the coal mine. If we today speak about the level of exploitation of workers that actually is defined as forced labor, modern slavery, laws, regulation that was established for um, exploitation in colonial territories, I think it shows a clear um, system failure in the global economy which uh, demands bold steps to correct it. Um, we, will, we are seeing failures in global migration governance, um, lack of transparency in bilateral agreements. We are seeing ineffective labor protection measures. The International Trade Union Confederation yearly publishes a report that measures labor protection of workers worldwide, and we see a downward trend in the last decades that is global and permanent. 
these gaps are being exploited by unscrupulous employers, by criminal organizations. Moreover, 40% of the 2.9 billion global workforce is working in the informal economy. That means they are working without the regulatory framework of uh, countries, without any protection, labor protection whatsoever, making them in, uh, very vulnerable to uh, trafficking, to forced labor. It's no use, again, Monique Villa uh, mentioned it this morning, that uh, corporations are abusing subcontracting systems to avoid their uh, um, responsibility. 60% um, today of the global trade is being done in subcontracted uh, parts of the economy, which means that, the, that companies ultimately do not accept responsibility for the treatment of people, workers, in that part of the economy. So to come to um, ways forward uh, and recommendations, um, in a global context, there is a need for binding regulation on uh, multinational companies for accountability throughout supply chains with extraterritorial um, responsibilities. There is a UN treaty on the table. Uh, we think it, de it deserves support. Uh, from government who have the right to regulate and monitor uh, the economy. That on a national level, and we've seen some uh, worthwhile um, initiatives at the national level in countries represented here in the UK, in France, uh, there, is, there are initiatives of mandatory due diligence requiring companies to take responsibility for extraterritorial actions and exploitation in this uh, regard. The, U the negotiations on the UN Global Compact on migration are an opportunity to set straight some of the, def the deficiencies of um, the global governance model of migration. What we have to date is bilateral agreements between countries on certain contingents of migrants, migrant workers, with no transparency. Um, that have generate two fundamental problems. One is um, it creates a reality or it creates a regulatory framework which does not co correspond to the reality of workers, migrant workers, and it does uh, and it does facilitate corruption, which is uh, again abused. I'll have to speed up. Um, and I'll reference as a specific recommendation the ILO protocol to combat forced labor, which was designed to bring together criminal justice spheres with labor or, or social justice spheres. Um, where in 2014, it was almost unanimously adopted. We've seen uh, four years later now only 22 ratifications, uh, while the ambition is to have 50 by the end of the year as it would require countries to design a national action plan, which most of the countries here already have, it would offer an opportunity to revise what actually works, link better with uh, labor stakeholders in the country, including business, including tra uh, trade unions, and revise uh, existing national action plans and frameworks. I think that's an, uh, an excellent opportunity. Uh, since I have only very limited time left, I'll come to the recruitmentadvisor.org, uh, which is a website that we recently launched um, that allows migrant workers to review um, <coughs> recruitment agencies and to review their experience with recruitment agencies. Um, whereas we started in uh, countries of mainly origin uh, countries for migrant workers, Nepal, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia, we very much hope to expand that to other countries. The review uh, website, uh, recruitmentadvisor.org, for those who are connected, allows uh, migrant workers to review the experience um, in a binary way, responding to questions, yes or no, um, against international standards, the uh, uh, general principles and operational guidelines for fair recruitment adopted again at the ILO. And it allows for all partners involved an added value. It allows for the migrant workers um, information that is coming from their peers, mig from migrant workers, on a platform 
not hosted commercially, not hosted by governments, but independent trade unions. It allows governments to find uh, irregular recruiters, informal recruiters, and take the necessary action. For ethical businesses, it allows, um, uh, well, it, it, it helps to ensure fair competition. And for trade unions, it allows them to connect with migrant workers to find um, the place where they can build the trust, as it was mentioned by the <coughs> moderator um, earlier, so that they can build collective power. So we are basically um, offering uh, our assistance in all the countries around the table at the international level, at the regional level. Um, organized labor is always a partner in uh, rule of law, in international labor law, and in uh, combating organized crime. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen, and uh, sorry for, uh, for pressuring you, but uh, we only have uh, 11 minutes uh, until we release the <laughs> and we set free <laughs> the translator, so I'm afraid that because our last speaker will speak in German, uh, we, we, need, uh, uh, them, we need him to, to have a sh fair share of uh, taking the floor. So uh, our last uh, speaker is um, uh, Monsignor Tomo Kresnetnovic, director of Caritas uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Since uh, 2015, Monsignor uh, uh, Knezevic is the director of uh, Caritas in Bosnia. Uh, as such, uh, he manages the, and governs the pastoral institution of the Catholic Church uh, charity. He is directly responsible for, um, um, <clears throat> for institutions um, and a team of uh, 13 uh, employees. He, he is also a university professor of liturgy and liturgical pastoral uh, and uh, of German language. Uh, since 2000, he is a uh, chaplain uh, in the uh, Magisterial of uh, Maltese Order. Uh, and uh, from 2001 to 2011, he, has the, he was the National Director of uh, Papal Missions uh, Institution in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He will uh, discuss uh, the contribution of religious organizations to the fight against human trafficking, and uh, also Caritas' uh, prevention activities and the importance of teachers and school uh, involvement. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, moderator. I will force myself to fit everything into 11 minutes. I had prepared for a quarter of an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, I represent the legal and legitimate charitable organization of the Catholic Church in Bosnia and Herzegovina. led by the Bishop's Conference, Church, and National Rules and regula Regulations. Today, I would like to share with all of those present the following topic. New methods for preventing human trafficking based on the activities of Caritas, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Caritas, Bosnia and Herzegovina has been carrying out a prevention program on trafficking in persons in Bosnia and Herzegovina since 2004. And we've been doing this via various activities, cooperating with different partners in Bosnia and Herzegovina. These include parishes, diocese Caritas in Sarajevo, Mostar and Banja Luka, family counselling centres, primary and middle schools, as well as government bodies and organisations, the border police, civil society organisations, the catechismal offices of our Catholic diocese in Sarajevo, Mostar, Trebinja and Banja Luka, the Interfaith Council of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and especially with the Office of the National Coordinator for the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Over these 14 years, Caritas's work in preventing trafficking in human beings. Our focus has been placed on carrying out educational programs for the most at-risk groups in Bosnia and Herzegovina, namely children, young people, women, the unemployed, and those without social protections, Roma, and those individuals who are seeking work, not just in Europe, but generally in other countries. 
Our second step, step was to carry out a campaign to counter this problem and to raise public awareness using specific media tools in newspapers, on the radio, on television, via social networks like Facebook and Twitter, using jumbled billboards, flyers, promotion flyers, films, audio and video adverts, plays and so forth. We also looked to other strategies such as employment and self-employment we focused on retraining, especially for young women, in tailoring of all kinds, beekeeping, poultry farming, livestock farming, pigs, sheep and dairy cows, cheese making, jam making, product sales, etc. At Caritas Bosnia and Herzegovina, we spent a lot of time thinking about what we could do Apart from preparing workshops and informing our neighbours and compatriots in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we considered using audio clips or video presentations, putting up posters or holding performances on the street and at markets. In 2017, based on the lessons that we learned, we decided to start to develop our activities via Catholic religion teachers in schools. We also wanted to work with the Interfaith Council of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Since 1997, there has been an Interfaith Council. It includes representatives of four churches and religious communities namely the Catholic Church, the Serbian Orthodox Church, the Muslim community and the Jewish community. And working together with Catholic religion teachers in various schools, we were involved in lesson planning. So during the annual planning and education in May 2017, Two-day preparatory workshops on the phenomenon of trafficking in persons were held. All of the religion teachers present were given tools for creating a lesson plan on how to prevent trafficking in human beings adapted to the age of their pupils. These included films, presentations and handbooks. The experience of working together with the religious studies teachers and the local offices of the Interfaith Council of Bosnia and Herzegovina gave rise to tangible results in communities. The young people who were seeking knowledge and information at various levels in the education system have themselves become educators and they can share everything with other people from their generation. With assistance from their religious studies teachers and the coordinators, they prepared a play and a performance. Caritas Bosnia and Herzegovina is part of the Caritas network in Europe and worldwide. And we work to address the problem of trafficking in persons in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is not just a problem for Bosnia and Herzegovina, but a question of international cooperation and an issue for international organisations. And that is why Caritas Bosnia and Herzegovina works with other organisations that are involved in prevention um, when it comes to trafficking in persons and then in rehabilitating and re-socialising the victims. Pope Franciscus himself is often involved in work to prevent trafficking in human beings and he has articulated it as one of the major problems of our time. We have two short films 
Invisibles and Devenir, which the Caritas Network has put together, they focus on the invisibility of the victims in various ways, and they also focus on the methods used for trafficking human beings. Currently, in the Euro-Mediterranean Network for the Prevention of Trafficking in Children, work is underway in a study in 15 different countries. Our country is one of those. In May 2018, we will host a meeting associated with this study. I'd also like to mention another network, CoatNet, which connects Christian organisations that work in this area through meetings, cooperation, and by distributing materials. At the end of my short, or rather shortened, presentation of the activities of Caritas Bosnia and Herzegovina on preventing trafficking in persons, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks for this invitation. First of all, to you at the OSCE. I'd also like to thank the National Coordinator of the National Office for cooperation that is taking place because it is very important that everybody in our society take responsibility for preventing human trafficking in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Cooperation is working despite a lack of resources in our day-to-day -day work to help those in need. Caritas Bosnia and Herzegovina will never let up our efforts. Thank you very much for your patience. Exactly. Thank you, Monsignor. Well, we, we've managed with the translators exactly on time, uh, so we have to release them. Um, well, I have to congratulate also, uh, before uh, opening the floor to, to delegations, uh, I have a list of seven. Uh, well, if, uh, just to finish with, uh, with, uh, with your presentation, uh, uh, we would like to highlight that it's a very important role that the church and the other religions can play on uh, raising awareness. Uh, it is a sin if I may use this word, happening before our eyes. And it's very important that we, we have religious prelates like the Pope and other ones that are really uh, trying to, um, uh, to, to highlight that issue with, within the liturgy, in the way they address uh, people of faith who are also playing a very important role, and faith-based NGOs as well. So now we don't have any translation uh, available, so uh, I have a list of seven um, delegations, and so if, uh, one of, uh, if, if there's a delegation that does not want to address our, uh, themselves in English, uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, move it to, to a later stage uh, tomorrow uh, when we'll, we will have a translation. So uh, Armenia is first on the list. I don't know if they will speak in English or, or uh, Russian. Um, sorry? English, English. English, okay. Dear Madame Jarbusinova, uh, dear moderator, excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It has been more than a decade that the Armenian government actively fights against human trafficking and exploitation, and during these years has achieved tangible results. This has become possible also based on establishing collaboration among all the stakeholders, state, civil society, and international organizations dealing with this phenomenon. Armenia is mainly a source country for men, women, and children subjected to trafficking in persons, especially forced labor and sex trafficking of women and men. Human trafficking trends have changed in recent years. Compared to previous years, when primarily Armenian women were trafficked to Turkey and the United Arab Emirates for sexual exploitation. Currently, the internal trafficking of women for sexual exploitation and men for forced labor has increased when compared to previous years. Nevertheless, Armenia is mainly a country, a country of origin for women and girls subjected to sexual, uh, sexual exploitation in the UAE and Turkey, and men subjected to labor exploitation in Russia and Turkey. During these years, we have uh, initiated numerous reforms on national level, as well as actively cooperated with all the international organizations active in this field. At policy level, starting from 2004, 
Armenia has adopted five national triennial action plans. Currently, the fifth NAP for the period of 2016-2018 is underway. Starting with 2010, the activities are mainly directed towards maximum enhancement of the state's efforts, especially in the spheres of prevention and assistance, through establishing and strengthening the necessary, stru necessary structures, sub-legislative, financial basis, as well as through capacity building of the players active in the area. To ensure continuation of the current anti-trafficking policy, the public awareness activities are implemented. The Anti-Trafficking Council of Armenia sponsors the official website, uh, www.antitrafficking.am, that was started by the Audiovisual Journalists Association. The Council also holds annual media award competition for the best reporting on human trafficking. In order to bring Armenia's legislation in conformity with the requirements of the Palermo Protocol, the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings and other international commitments, the Law on Identification and Support to Persons Subjected to Trafficking in Human Beings and Exploitation was adopted, as well as seven bylaws aiming to ensure its, uh, its implementation. The law regulates procedures for identifying and supporting persons subjected to trafficking or exploitation, including foreigners and stateless persons, providing with them with relevant resident status and safe return. The identification of victims and assistance provided to them is not conditioned by the cooperation with the law enforcement. The assistance includes also a lump sum monetary compensation provided by the state. One of the important new features of the procedure for identification of victims of THB, which was introduced by the new law, is the establishment of the Commission on Identification of Victims of Trafficking in Human Beings and Exploitation as a single body to confirm the status of the victim of human trafficking, which is comprised of both law enforcement and social partners on one hand and NGOs providing assistance on the other. It means that any time that central government or local self-government uh, bodies suspect that a person with whom they are dealing may be a victim of trafficking or exploitation, they refer the person to the Identification Commission. The second, the second very important point, the adoption of the identification law, cancelled and replaced the national referral mechanism for victims of human trafficking adopted earlier in 2008 and rearranged the identification procedure for trafficked persons. The changes were made following the visit of Ms. Uh, Jarbusinova to Armenia and a consequent report, the Council of Europe's Greta First Evaluation Report, and our partners from the U.S. Department of State, human rights monitoring bodies. Currently, in accordance with the new law, victims' identification is carried out in two stages, pre-identification and identification, and is totally delinked from the criminal proceedings and is no way preconditioned by the victim's uh, cooperation with the law enforcement. Multi-agency approach is a key of our success on all levels and all stages of victim identification, referral, assistance, and reintegration, as well as in case of organizing victims' repatriation and safe return. Victims' needs and interests are the basis for the protection, whereas the restoration of their rights are the main goals for the, uh, of this cooperation. This became possible due to several reasons. First of all, I would like to mention the political will. Combating human trafficking is one of the key priorities of the Armenian government. Secondly, it is ongoing capacity building of all relevant actors dealing with identification, referral, and reintegration, which includes police, police officers, social workers, uh, unemployed, employment agencies, NGOs working in the sphere with vulnerable groups, journalists, school teachers, local authorities, healthcare ins uh, institutions, consular services, uh, border guards, etc. And finally, it is the coordination of efforts both horizontally and vertically, including first line actors, anti trafficking working group members, and the council representatives. Moreover, on June 4, 2015, the annual award ceremony for universal rights was organized in Yerevan, which was attended by Armenian state officials, foreign uh, officials and diplomats, representatives of non-governmental and international organizations, as well as the mass media. During this ceremony, the Anti-Trafficking uh, uh, Working Group of Armenia has been awarded the Universal Rights Award in the Government Reformer category. According to our international partners, the work of the Armenian anti-trafficking community can serve as a model of excellent cooperation and coordination among all actors. 
due to effective multi-stakeholder and multi-step collaboration and coordinated efforts uh, of the working group during recent years, it became possible to arrange the repatriation of several Armenian citizens. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleague. And uh, of course, uh, I remind uh, all delegations that uh, there is a time uh, uh, constraint here, three to five minutes, so please uh, um, take that note. And also uh, that our distinguished uh, delegates, our panelists are also, uh, there are questions for them as well, so I, I would welcome uh, delegates to ask them uh, uh, things that are, they consider important from their presentations. And of course, uh, also, uh, we should introduce ourselves when we take the floor. <coughs> so uh, the second uh, delegate on the list is the OSE project coordinator in Ukraine. Please, the floor is yours for three minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll try to be really brief. And uh, thanks for giving me the floor. My name is Vaidota Sverba, and I'm ambassador and OSE project coordinator in Ukraine. Well, the bare title of our conference, everyone has a role, how to make a difference together confirms the importance of an inclusive and integrated anti-trafficking policies and practices. While the OSC provides growing importance to develop policy guidance and offers a platform for cooperation of all relevant stakeholders from governments, international organizations, or civil society, the OSC field missions like ours offer a practical, country-related and country-tailored approach. Briefly, let me uh, tell you about the job OC project coordinator in Ukraine is doing in cooperation with Ukrainian partners and the OC headquarters to fight uh, uh, trafficking of uh, human beings. Over 1.5 million people have been displaced due to the crisis in the of Ukraine. The vulnerability of Ukraine citizens of becoming victims of various forms of human trafficking has significantly increased. The coordinator actively supported the development of the national referral mechanism, which facilitates cooperation between the state offices and non-governmental organizations to help victims, victims to obtain access to, uh, to proper assistance. OC project coordinator in Ukraine actively cooperates with the multiple Ukrainian stakeholders, including the Ukrainian Ministry of Social Policy, Ministry of Interior, National Police, General Prosecutor's Office, and Supreme Court social workers, labor inspectors, and item trafficking non-governmental organizations from all the regions of all the country. The focus of coordinators' anti-trafficking activities lies on prevention, the strengthening of, pro uh, of prosecution of per perpetrators and assistance to victims. This includes, first, providing expertise to support drafting of laws and regulations. Second, awareness raising campaigns. Third, training for judges, law enforcement officers, medical practitioners, social authorities, lawyers, consular of officials, the media, and the civil society representatives. The important role of the OSC is to support all national stakeholders with the emphasis on civil society and NGOs who work at the grassroots level and assist those who are forced to labor exploitation and trafficking. The coordinator supports the empowerment of anti-trafficking civil society organizations with uh, social businesses models to ensure that they are able to operate independently. Following 2017 OC International Conference in Kiev on combating human trafficking for labor exploitation co-organized co by uh, PCU in Ukraine in cooperation and participation of OSC Special Representative on, and, coordinate, and Coordinator of combat, for Combating Trafficking of Human being, Beings, Ambassador Jerbusinova. I, I offer her my gratitude and thanks for her support and collaboration. We develop further OSC role as a platform for cooperation against labor exploitation and trafficking. This year, this year, 2018, was announced in Ukraine as the year of joining efforts to combat trafficking of human beings. And let me assure that PCU will continue to further support all national stakeholders to strengthen the response to all forms of human trafficking. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, now it's a UNITAS fund, please. UNITAS fund. Uh, good at just. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emily Fink, and this is my colleague, Aris Cardas. We are representing Unitas Fund, an international NGO committed to fight against human trafficking. 
and more especially working on prevention and education of children and youths against human trafficking. First, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation and the opportunity to present our program, Prevention and Education of Children and Youth About Human Trafficking. The program was launched in 2016 in collaboration with Minister of Education and Center for Fighting Human Trafficking Serbia. As you know, today in the world, uh, there is more than 20, 30 billion, millions of human trafficking victims uh, who are exploited through labor and sexual trafficking, and more than 25% of them are children. This statistic is concerning, and it is obvious that we need something, it needs to be something to done, and what is a better place to reach and educate people than school? Therefore, UNITAS Fund, together with the government institutions, developed a holistic, effective and particular pro program that will enable and equip students and teachers all across the country with the knowledge and the tools necessary to prevent their students from being trafficked, to identify victims of human trafficking in their classes and to raise a generation of responsible citizens that don't overlook the issue to become a part of the problem. Through this program, what we want to achieve to reduce the risks of children and youth be trafficked by increasing the capacities in educational system for prevention action and preliminary identification of children who are potential victims. Our target groups by implementing this program were teachers and experts, associates, students from 10 until 15 years old, parents and the wider community around each school because every need, every Every person needs to know that human trafficking exists. Uh, our main goal was to invite and to improve capacities of educational system in preliminary identification of children and potential human trafficking victims. What have we done? Together with the Ministry of Education, we uh, have done a couple of workshops by uh, introducing the indicators how into the school system, how teachers can indicate that some of their student is a potential human trafficking victim and what they need to do in accordance if they are recognizing this problem. Uh, as well, we developed a training material and particular tool which can assist teachers and is assisting teachers in implementing effective prevention workshops with their students. They equipped uh, professors and teachers uh, to work with children and to understand, uh, to understand what are the risks of human trafficking and they are using different methods uh, for different age groups for 10 until 15 years old. So, besides, uh, we wanted to inform students, uh, students and teachers, experts, we wanted as well to inform the parents that human trafficking is a part of our problem. So, based on the program, prevention education program, we informed as well parents that this problem is existing and that we need to do something in order to prevent our children not to, bec to become human trafficking victims. Our approach was, first, to Manage, uh, we uh, have the partnership with government institution, Minister of Education and Center for Human Trafficking Victims Protection. Uh, ho we used holistic and teacher-centered approach where uh, we implemented the manual with different designed workshops which are easily uh, to used by professors and experts into the schools. Uh, we use age-appropriate resources with different activities which are directly based in the manual and the material which is in every school in Serbia, how teachers need and should work with children in order to inform them about human trafficking problem. One of the main approaches uh, is train the trainers approach. Through the train the trainers approach and together with Ministry of Education, we educate based on this program 80 professionals, 80 experts from 70 school districts in Serbia. Then these teachers educate their colleagues, where more than 6,000 teachers until now were educated on this program. And they, got, and they then start to work with children in uh, more than 600 schools in Serbia, where more than 60,000 children got informed based on this program, which is a huge number. Uh, based, uh, besides the manual, which is introduced into the educational system as a part of educational curriculum, we presented the film The Observers. Uh, which is an educational tool uh, which is played in every school in Serbia and it is translated in five different languages. As well, we played the campaign and the filmed observers on the national television of Serbia because we wanted 
to gain awareness, not only by the teachers, the students and the parents, but also to the general population, where more than 300,000 people saw the campaign and get aware that this problem is a part of our society and our presence. Um, I wanted to, uh, to, to mention that uh, the main objectives of this program is that this is program which is implemented in educational system. We have sufficient work materials and the key intention of this program is to get this program to be a sustainable part of government institution. The government institution of Serbia, but not only of Serbia, we want to try to implement this program as well in the region and other countries because we think this material and this program is a good method on which every of us needs to work in order to prevent our children not to become a human trafficking victims and to get informed about this, about this problem. Uh, this program is currently adjusting uh, as a part of implementation and our collaboration with OCA Skopje, and we hope that this program, on the same way, uh, time that please, we can have you please done conclude? In Serbia, sorry, sorry to interrupt. In, every in Skopje as well. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I want to just to say that everyone has a role, and how can we make a difference? I think everyone knows the answer. Only together we are stronger. And only together we can make a change and a better world for our children and the whole population. Only if we are united we can make a change. So let's make a change and let's collaborate together in order to have a good prevention and education program uh, for fighting against human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Unitas. And indeed, uh, uh, prevention in schools uh, is, a, is a game changer. and. Uh, we would like to see many OSC countries really taking on board uh, human rights education in schools, reproductive health education, sexual education, and it's a very important thing. Uh, the next on the list is the Holy See, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. The delegation of the Holy See welcomes the opportunity to express its gratitude uh, to the Italian chairmanship of the OSCE to the OEC Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings, to all those who have contributed to the organizing of this conference, and to the panelists for their valuable presentations. My delegation will present some brief points during each of the three panels in order to contribute to the discussion of the crucial topics before us. With reference to the questions proposed in the present panel, I would like to observe the following. In these years, when the Alliance had to op the opportunity to study in depth the phenomenon of the trafficking of human beings and to verify the progress of the fight against it, it has emerged with extreme clarity that this phenomenon is much more widespread and entrenched in our societies than we imagined even only a few years ago. The attempts made to find the human trafficking and its deleterious consequences on adults and minors, as well as on the human and cultural fabric of different societies, despite some positive results, are still insufficient to adequately counteract this phenomenon. Much still remains to be done also to increase awareness of the problem, its magnitude, and connections. For this reason, the Holy See would consider it important to reflect on the various levels on involvement of involvement with human trafficking, how various sections and strata of our societies, in one way or another, knowingly or unknowingly, interact with the trafficking on human beings. Only a complete picture, a complete understanding of the problem will allow us to address it fully. I conclude therefore by inviting the panelists to comment on the unseen and unaddressed linkage between society and governments and human trafficking. Those are often the supporting nets of this skinny sketch. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
the last uh, country on our list is Ireland. The floor is yours. Thank you. As long as prostitution can be considered sex work, trafficking for prostitution can be considered migration for sex work. And yes, I've heard that language used to conceal and obscure the reality of what's happening in trafficking, just as I've heard the term sex work used to conceal and obscure the reality of what's happening in prostitution. So my question is, how long is the international anti-trafficking movement going to keep on repeating this counterproductive and damaging nonsense language? My second question is, how long are we going to continue to ignore the major issue of Soros-funded NGOs like Amnesty International calling for the full decriminalization of all aspects of the global sex trade? Let me be clear that all aspects of the sex trade includes pimping, brothel keeping and sex buying. It involves the legal endorsement of all elements of exploitation within the global sex trade. And this as a policy recommendation from the most famous human rights organization on the earth. Removing all legal penalties from pimps is a recipe for sex trafficking. And I want to know at what point we intend to challenge this dangerous nonsense from Amnesty International and others. Thank you. Thank you, Ireland. Uh, <laughs> well, this is certainly a, a contentious issue and, uh, uh, you know, the abolitionist Nordic model versus the sex worker model. Uh, in my country as well, we have a committee in reviewing the Nordic model and I understand there's a, a lot of friction and turmoil on that. And I'm glad that you're raising it because we need to address political issues and you're with, I'm with you there. Sorry? Yes. Um, and uh, last uh, country uh, on my list is the United Kingdom, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador, uh, for convening this meeting and recognizing the importance of partnership in combating human trafficking. We would like to thank you, the OSCE and ODIR for all your work on this agenda to date, and we hope that the momentum you are generating will continue to grow. The OSCE's membership, together with, with its extensive network of field offices, gives it a particular reach which we should optimize. We would also like to thank Italy for, making, for ta making tackling human trafficking a priority during its chairmanship and for its work at the UN uh, in New York also. Tackling human trafficking and modern slavery is a top priority for the UK. We are committed to working with fellow governments alongside international organizations, civil society and the private sector to make this a global priority. At last year's UNGA, uh, UN General Assembly, our Prime Minister joined the UN Secretary General and other world leaders to launch the call to action, which has now been endorsed by over 50 countries. I would also like to support the recommendation made by the panelists from the ITU, ITUC in recommending that countries ratify the ILO protocol also. Effective partnership and cooperation are crucial. We cannot treat the issues of forced labor, modern slavery and human trafficking in isolation. These are complex crimes and we need to treat them as such. This means reaching out and creating partnerships with civil society and the private sector, working across borders and mandates. In the UK, the Prime Minister set up a task force in 2016, a key coordination mechanism, which brings together every relevant department to get a grip of trafficking in human beings and to coordinate and drive further progress in the battle against this cruel exploitation. The membership of this task force has crucially been designed to help drive forward the operational response with an unusually high number of intelligence and policing experts joining ministers around the table. Along with the PM's task force, ministers regularly engage with stakeholders from civil society and business. In the UK, we are, uh, we are increasing our engagement, uh, bilateral engagement with a number of countries and our operational response um, and source countries from where a high number of vulnerable people are exploited and trafficked into the UK. We are working in partnership with these countries to improve our, improve our understanding of the context that leads to vulnerable people being exploited and trafficked to the UK to better inform our approach and operational response. Thank you. 
Thank you, United Kingdom. I have uh, two more countries, but I, they will take the floor tomorrow because they need translation. And now I give the floor to our distinguished panelists for a comment uh, on uh, what uh, um, has been um, uh, raised by other by the by the delegates. Um, so I, I'm starting with you, Mr. Kurz. Uh. Thank you. Uh, I heard the delegate of the OEC uh, pointing out that it's very important to, to have a link between society, governments, on the issue of human trafficking. I think that it is very important and it should be a, a good practice for each country to, to, uh, to find the place uh, to gather uh, the government, the representative of the, of the d different de departments of the government, and the, the civil society to, to discuss about human trafficking. Uh, I, I'm sure that they, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't agree each other on how to, uh, how to deal with uh, this, uh, this phenomenon. But in fact, what is important is to have this meeting, to have this discussion, to have this understanding of what it is. I think it is the first step to go forward <coughs> in the, the strike again, the, the, sorry, the struggle against uh, human uh, trafficking. On the issue about uh, sex trade, I, I, I would say it's, it's a political position uh, as a prosecutor, well, we, we, don't, we don't have really uh, to, uh, to, to, to make a decision uh, uh, on, on, on this point. There are di different uh, sides and uh, different, um, uh, I, I would say, uh, legislation that have been taken and there are some assessment now about these legislations, I think that it belongs to uh, the governments to, to take the part of it if they want. <coughs> well, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, this problem uh, is being faced not only by the developing uh, countries around the world, but also developed countries alike. So I think it is important that uh, uh, developed countries especially, they give much, much thought to the possibility of working very actively together with especially those countries around the world which are at very big risk uh, because of this, uh, because of the human trafficking problem. And uh, I know that many countries, especially the donor, the donor countries, international organizations, which are involved in, this, in, these, issued, in these issues, uh, they're not really looking at it as a long-term problem. They're trying to, we're trying to deal with it in a, sh a very short-term, on a very short-term basis. So I think we have to uh, reorganize our thinking about how to deal with this problem in the future. And this problem will, uh, will be much more difficult to deal with in, years, in the years to come. And we really need a comprehensive, comprehensive uh, strategy that would actually uh, that would actually would uh, squarely deal with with, with this problem. And uh, uh, speaking is, uh, is 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 uh, is 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 important, but really implementing those legal instruments that we have all together adopted is much more important. And especially countries, the developing countries have great difficulties, even if they have very good legislation, they have great difficulties in, uh, in implementing, in really implementing the legislations they have adopted. Thank you. 
And I'm sure you agree that the issue of ownership has to do also with education. So I suppose uh, education in schools is a, a formidable uh, prevention strategy in terms of ownership uh, in the f in, for the future generations. Exactly. We specifically worked with our Ministry of Education on this point, and we were, uh, we were very much insistent in, uh, in making sure that the topic of human trafficking be included in the social, uh, social program, programs of our schools, secondary schools, as well as in universities and uh, uh, other higher educational institutions. We were able to get two very specific tools to be implemented in the secondary schools and higher educational establishments. That was very important. The thing is, the thing is, still because of the difficulties of, uh, of the government institutions, especially the Ministry of Education, to allow, to have a spe specific subject as a, as a matter of, curric as, as, a, as a curriculum uh, in, within this, this is a very big issue because many, of, many such issues are there, but if, we, if, if uh, institutions try to get all those issues in the curriculum of uh, education of our educational establishments, this seems to be a very big issue. So, but in any case, we were able to get something in it, and it's, it's important that it stays there in the future. Thank you, Mirun. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, and also thanks to the UK for the support on the ratification of the ILO protocol, and congratulations on their own uh, ratification. Um, as to the only question that was raised, um, I think uh, it was a fair point to be made that the, that trafficking in human beings is actually endemic um, in the, the texture of our current societies, and it translates on all levels. Um, whether I think it's a it's a, a reflection of increasing individualization, uh, social exclusion, discrimination. Some people thinking that others um, deserve lef less rights um, than themselves. I think we see it uh, reflected at the international level in in kind of a stalemate of e or even a crisis in multilateralism. Governments don't trusting each other to actually speak on a multilateral platform to raise the standard rather than to undermine it. Um, companies competing with each other actually racing to the bottom in terms of uh, paying people's wages, uh, respecting people's decency, and in general societal uh, individualization that um, somehow um, pushes people to limit their own responsibilities to the immediate uh, uh, environment that they live in. We, f we face it on all levels. It means we also face it in the international trade union movement. There is, for, for us also, um, clearly a role in, in regenerating this kind of global international solidarity and where people realize that actually, if, we're, if everybody's competing with everyone, if, if all countries are competing with everyone, if all companies are competing with everyone, we actually, um, we're, we're um, heading for a disaster. So. If, if this can be an exercise, a forum that helps to re-establish this trust and some, uh, some upward uh, lift in standards, I think it's a worthwhile exercise. Absolutely. Um, Monsignor, uh, I think you have a chance tomorrow if you want to take the floor uh, with the translation. Uh, I understand that, uh, Martin, uh, you must have a hard job in uh, taking the recommendations and presenting them uh, tomorrow as well. So uh, I would like to uh, thank um, our distinguished panelists and all of you for the, your participation and attention. Um, and I give the floor to the ambassador for some technical notes. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, our moderator uh, for allowing not only uh, to listen to the uh, findings and recommendations of our panelists, but also for uh, giving some uh, chance for uh, the discussion from the uh, floor. So thank you, Heraklis, uh, for your contribution to the success 
I'm sure tomorrow we will speak about the success of our uh, alliance with more discussions coming ahead. And also, I um, encourage you to uh, uh, discuss the issues during the uh, cocktail uh, hosted by our uh, Italian chairmanship, which will take place just uh, here uh, behind the uh, doors. But uh, before uh, we go to this uh, cocktail part of our uh, today's uh, work, uh, they, I'd like to remind you that we very much um, appreciate and um, uh, rely on your uh, feedback on the organization of uh, uh, the Alliance Conference, on the content of the discussion. So just uh, we uh, developed this uh, very uh, short uh, survey, which you may uh, find on the uh, uh, which I first uh, want you to uh, complete and uh, share uh, with us, and you will find it uh, on the uh, uh, web page. And also, uh, uh, you may uh, fill in the uh, hard form of this uh, questionnaire and leave it uh, with us in the special uh, box arranged for your feedbacks. So thank you uh, for uh, your patience. Uh, we are uh, behind the schedule, and I'd like to invite you to the cocktail party.